Well, welcome, church. It's good to see each and every one of you. It's good to see some new faces. Um, we're glad that you came to worship with us this morning. And um, thank you to our worship team for leading us into God's presence. Um, oh, there it goes. There it goes. It's always like that, that critical moment, you know. It's like, are they going to clap or is it just going to like be a half a clap? No. No, it's good. Um, you know, this morning before I, I get into the message that I, I feel the Lord's laid on my heart, um, I wanted to just share with you and, and, and touch on a few of the announcements that were given. And one, I'll give you a little bit of a report. How many of you were with us on Wednesday night for our night of worship? Man, it was so good. It was so good just to, to be in here and to sit in God's presence. And we were led by um, Pete Shembrook from Rock Harbor Orange. And um, Pete just a man of God. And, and what I loved about the time is it, was, it wasn't like um, rocket science, you know. It was we get here, we turn the lights on, we prepare our hearts, and we sing to Jesus. And that's what we did, and it was beautiful. And I felt like God was really just restoring our souls. And, and, and so um, that's why it makes me excited about this coming Wednesday. And if you were with us on the, the grand reopening that we had for the or dedication of the building, you met Tully. Tully was one of the worship leaders that came in the evening service. And so the significance of these times of, of gathering together for worship is to open, um, open up this place for um, fellowship together, not just with ourselves, but with other churches in the community. When we sang that just now, that we exalt thee, and I shared with you that we're part of something bigger, that means that there are other churches down the street that don't meet on a, on a Wednesday night. And uh, we have this great, big, beautiful place. And isn't it silly that it wouldn't be filled with other believers, that we couldn't worship together without being kind of jealous and weird with one another, you know, that we could just be together and worship Jesus. And so that's um, what the intent of that night is. And, and so if you are available and you want to come, we'd love to have you. I think you'd really enjoy it. And then um, secondly, in the flyer, you saw the, the theme for Easter um, is on the third day. And, um, and I got to really just say that when you begin to think about the, the steps in towards Easter, and that's what we're going to talk about today as we open up God's Word, is kind of getting our march towards, towards Easter in our own hearts. But um, you think of that resurrection day, and that literally changed everything, didn't it? It pretty much did for me. Um, <clears throat> Andy, I think I want a tag team. Yeah, you were doing really good on announcements, so let's get Andy up here. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, it really does. It changes everything. And, and, and that third day, that day of resurrection, and what I always think of is, is, is prior to that in, in our lives, at least I could say in my life, you, you're striving and striving and you feel like um, disappointment after disappointment. And you feel even to that point where hope is lost, you know, and you can only imagine where the, the early believers who had walked with Jesus feel like hope is gone, right? Hope is lost. And then um, the death of Jesus, and then that, on that third day, as the scripture says, that he rose again, that, that sense that hope is back in the building, and hope is alive. And so, um, so Jesus is alive, and we're excited to tell the story. And, and there's many ways that you can invite people to Easter, um, but the best way is just to say, hey man, you want to come to church with me on Easter? So uh, I would encourage you, invite someone to come to church on Easter. It's very culturally acceptable for anyone to come to church on Easter. It's what people do, right? So, um, but we have invites for you. We have social media stuff and all the other bells and whistles that we can provide to help you, but I think the best way always is relationship, don't you? Uh, invite someone to church. It'll be awesome. So um, that's that, and then the final thing that I wanted to share with you is the reason that we changed the work day uh, is because uh, those of you that, that maybe know Manuel Fernando, Manuel Fernando went home to be with Jesus, and Manuel uh, was a, an evangelist and just a man of God uh, from the nation of India, and he was known in India as the Billy Graham of India. And literally in years past had done uh, massive uh, evangelism in that nation. And, and many people there were um, touched. The culture really around where he was really just shaped by, by this guy. And, and we had had the privilege over the last 30 some years, 35 years I think, to support the ministry of Christ for India. And so um, when he went home to be with the Lord, it was a a, a sad day, no doubt, but also a wonderful day, you know, where um, just like we had been talking about Billy Graham of America, Billy Graham, um, who, who went home to be with Jesus, it's like you understand these men are probably like all together just like high-fiving, <laughs> well done, yeah, you too, man. I mean, you can only imagine what glory is like, and, and so um, 
We're going to celebrate Manuel's life here on Saturday the 17th. And so we'd love if you could be here, uh, if you know him, or if you want to just show support to the family. But at any rate, I wanted to make sure that you knew that that was the reason why. And then, um, gosh, I feel like announcement central over here. So that was it for me. Let's get into the Bible. How about that? John chapter 12. Amen. All right. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. John chapter 12. Um, last week, we began to, to look at this chapter 12, and um, we talked about this anointing at um, Bethany, and where um, you have— Mar- <laughs> can I just share with you a little secret? I slept like two hours last night, and here's why. Because I knew that I lost an hour, and I couldn't get that out of my head. Have you ever—I just—you couldn't, you can't get that out of your head, like, I'm losing an hour. I'm losing an hour. And so you can't fall asleep, so you're thinking of everything, and you keep looking at the clock. If I fall asleep right now, I'll get, like, five hours. If I fall asleep right now, I'll get, like, three hours. You know, it was terrible. So I'm just giving the, the uh, disclaimer now. I, I can't even hear myself talk. It's just like a big—you're like a big blur. Everything's like, raw, 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 as I'm going. So if, if there's anything good that happens today, it's because of Jesus, all right? So uh, John chapter 12. Um, this is on—I'll tell you, just easy killer. Come on now. Okay, so we're, we're going to—I'm going to go through the whole process here. But John chapter 12, um, it, it begins back with— um, with the story, it's on the heels of the miracle of Lazarus. And can you imagine, can you imagine living in those times where the buzz, and, and even scholars talk about how gossip worked in the early church and in the, in the days of Jesus. Like everybody's talking about stuff. I know that it's not an issue or it doesn't happen anymore. Thank God there's no gossip in the church. But, but, but back in the day, everybody would be talking about things that were happening and the buzz around Galilee, the buzz around Jerusalem, and the buzz around these places where Jesus would come in and out was, was about things like Jesus raising his good friend from the dead who was dead dead, right? Lazarus was not kind of dead. He was good and smelly dead. The scripture even tells us this if you were to read the account. And so we know for certain it wasn't like he was a little sick and, and, and something happened, but Jesus did a miracle in Lazarus' life. And so there's this theme, this buzz that's already going around the community about resurrection life and about what Jesus can do. And that makes some people really excited and it makes other people really nervous. The, the seekers after Jesus, the ones who want to follow him and know him and see him are really excited that this one who claims to have hope can really do hopeful things like raise the dead to life. The religious establishment of the time is super nervous about it. And they're plotting to not only kill Jesus, but they're like, we might as well take Lazarus out while we're at it. Because these two guys are changing the whole scene. And, and what they were doing was they were taking people away from the traditional Judaism that, that the early, that these um, Pharisees and, and spiritual leaders had been speaking and preaching. And they were taking people away from that. And the, the term that it says in scripture is, is, this is doing us no good. It says, the whole world is going after him. Amazing. Amazing how it is. And so prior to that, um, that statement, you read in this situation, and this is what we talked about last week, where they're all together for a meal. And you remember this meal that Lazarus was reclining. And I always think that that's great because he had just been raised from the dead. And man, that guy just deserved to recline on. Like he was just reclining with the others at the table. And Martha was doing what Martha does. Martha was serving and making the meal happen, right? And, and Mary was doing what Mary does. She was attending to Jesus and she was at the feet of Jesus and we talked about generosity last week and how she took a a pint of really expensive perfume and what did she do with it? She didn't just spritz a little bit of it. She didn't like do this or that. She poured the whole thing out on Jesus' feet and she wept at his feet and she dried the, 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 the tears and the the perfume with her hair and the aroma that filled the place. And then what does Judas do? Judas steps up to the scene and goes, what's going on here? Judas says, I can't believe you just wasted all that. Um, that. That could have been sold, and the money, that's one year's wage, could have been given to the poor. Do you remember this story? And so within this story, um, Jesus steps in, and, and I, one of these awesome moments where Jesus just defends her and says, no, you, you don't, Judas, you don't have a clue. You're already filled with the devil. You don't have a clue. What she's doing is preparing me for my burial. And so in that, you, you see these characters and these people that are, are, are living out for us what it means to what it means to serve, what it means to give, what it means to be lavish. And the only one in that story that wasn't doing that was Judas. Judas was a taker all day long. The scripture unfolds to us that he was motivated by this great wealth being 
cashed in to quote unquote give to the poor because he himself was taking, right? And I, I, I shared with you as our congregation and we had this financial report. Man, Gary, you did such a fantastic job and we really appreciate all your work. And, and I shared with you about your generosity as a church and I thanked you and I meant every word of it and I affirmed it. But then God just did something really cool, like really miraculous that like only God would do. Do you remember we talked all this generosity talk and then we, we, we um, gave a financial report and we have this like awesome stretch goal to pay this building off in, in eight years. And, and so but we did all that before we took any offering. We said, this isn't that, right? This isn't like dim the lights, do the slideshow, give more money. It wasn't that. We took an offering before we said all of that, okay? So you're tracking with me? So, so I get the little, uh, I get a text actually that says, can you believe this? Our offering that particular Sunday, without you even knowing what we were talking about, was more than double of our normal everyday offering. Isn't that amazing? Those, <laughs> to me, those are just those little, little signs that, that God is on the move and, and he is, doing things through you. Um, and so I just wanted to commend you. And I wanted to show a, a picture on the screen. Um, I don't know if we got that available or not, but this is a, a, a photo that we received via email. And this is a newspaper article of Viva College, the best in, um, in, in Uganda. And this is um, where Answering for the Children is sending their, uh, their teenage kids. And it's like a, a, a college preparatory school. And it's dope, Bev. It's dope. It says it right in there. It's the swag. Uh, <laughs> this, this publication is called Swag. And it says that this is one of the dopest um, colleges around. But um, aside from all that slang, th what, what they're saying in here about um, how this particular school is getting a generation ready for the sciences, for engineering, for, um, for really transformation of their nation. And the reason that I'm showing this um, to you today is that you as a congregation have been sending kids to this school and, and some of the best schools in Uganda for over 18 years. And so I just want you to know, we don't sit there and blow our trumpet and that's not even what I'm doing now. I just want you to know that because you give generously, we're able to pass that on and transform young people's lives who were, who were really meant for... Um, um, and their parents abandoned them. Some of them suffered from AIDS, all kinds of things. And they've been taken into a home. They've been loved on. They've been given not only a second chance, but they've been given a, a great opportunity to be um, world changers in their nation. So anyways, I just wanted you to know that. And I wanted to applaud you and thank you for um, your generosity. So back to John chapter 12, we find ourselves, I'm going to um, not skip over the triumphal entry, but Pastor Andy's going to handle that on, on um, Palm Sunday. And so I want to get to verse 20, um, where we begin to talk about Jesus' prediction of his own death. And so I'm going to read to you um, uh, quite a bit of scripture here. And the reason that I do is that if my preaching is no good, you at least get a lot of scripture to meditate on. So here's, what, here's John chapter 12, starting in verse 20. It says, Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the feast. And they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. I want you to remember that. Verse 22, Philip went to tell Andrew, and Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. And Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant will also be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Verse 27, it says, Now my heart is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And then a voice came from heaven and says, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. And the, and the crowd that was there heard it and said it thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Verse 30, the voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now it is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of the world um, will be driven out. Verse 32, but I, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. And he said this to show the kind of death that he was going to die. The crowd spoke up. We have heard from the law in Christ that, for, um, 
that the Christ will remain forever. So how can you say the son of man must be lifted up? And who is this son of man? And Jesus told them, you are going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk in the light while you have the light before the darkness overtakes you. The man who walks in the dark does not know where he's going. Put your trust in the light while you have it so that you may become sons of the light. And when he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. I can only imagine what it would have been like um, to be in that setting among that crowd where so many things were happening. Jesus was answering a certain request, and I'm going to get to that in just a moment. And then um, he says to the Father, Father, glorify yourself. And then when God talks, it's unmistakable. I mean, the, the thunderous, the Psalms say his voice is like thunder on the water, you know. And so if you're among that crowd and, and, and God speaks that he's glorifying his son and he's going to do it again and people are hearing this. It was like a, a huge moment. But if you rewind back to the very first thing that I read, this is where I meditated. This is where, um, where the scripture popped out to me. And when you're reading scripture, you pay attention to those things that, that just stick out. And sometimes things stick out to you and you're like, I don't know why that sticks out to me. It's important to, to sit there and, and think about it and meditate on it as you read the Bible. And so, so here's what it was for me. It was the fact that in 21, this guy Philip, who's one of Jesus' disciples, he's from a specific place, he's approached by the Greeks with a, a certain request. They would like to see Jesus, right? The Greeks wanted to see Jesus. Now, just prior to that, it had been said that whatever was going on was doing no good because the whole world is going after Jesus. And now you have Greeks, right? The, the people coming to him and saying, we would like to see Jesus, and the interesting thing about their request was that they were not Jewish. Um, we know from history that there were many that during the Passover time would come and, and they were interested in Judaism. They were interested in worship. They were, some were God-fearing, um, but they weren't grafted into Judaism. They were, they were Gentiles. They requested to see Jesus and, um, and they asked Philip, right? Philip uh, is from a place in Galilee where um, just in that particular area, same place that Peter was from, same place that Nathaniel was from, where it's a fishing area, and, and a lot of Greeks were there. And so it was kind of like these, these contingents of Greeks see their guy. There's Philip, and maybe he can get us an audience with Jesus. Have you ever just been so curious about someone or something that you just really wanted to meet them? I mean like geeky kind of curious, like I'll do anything to get there, you know, and, and, and you just, you're, you're fascinated with something and you're in this situation. It was kind of, in, in my impression, and maybe I'm using too much imagination, but it was kind of like that, that they wanted to see him. And, uh, and that got me thinking about, about this thing called curiosity, right? Curiosity. Um, I read this quote from Albert Einstein, and here's what it says. It says, one cannot help be in awe when he contemplates the mysteries of eternity of life, of the marvelous structures of reality. It's enough if one tries merely to comprehend a little of this every day, mystery every day, excuse me. And then that last sentence is where I camp out. Never lose holy curiosity. These Greeks were seekers and they wanted to know something about God and they wanted to see something about what was going on with Jesus. Others had been curious, but maybe for different reasons, and Jesus responds accordingly. You remember that people ask Jesus for a sign, and they get a rebuke, right? You remember that, that um, Herod is just really anxious to see Jesus and meet him, has a lot of questions, and Jesus is silent. In this situation, they're asking to see Jesus, and he has a reply. The reply is probably not at all what they had expected to hear, and... Um, but before I get into that reply, I wanted to just take a moment and, and talk about curiosity. Because for many of us, something happens at a certain point in our life where um, we lose something so precious and so genius and so beautiful. What we lose is our childlikeness. Everything becomes complicated. Everything becomes like, well, why, what? If you're around kids, and I love to be around kids, when you're around kids, it's a different thing altogether. They don't have all those bad experiences. They don't have any of those things. What they have is eyes wide open. What they have is a lot of questions, right? Especially at a certain time in life. I remember my own kids when the, the question was, why, 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 why? And you can look at that one of two ways as a parent. You can be like, because I said, you know? Or you can realize that something is developing in them. My wife really helped 
me understand that, helped us understand that, and just un in her understanding of early childhood development, that there's something going on in those early years where we can make a humongous mistake. The humongous mistake that we can make among children is slapping their hands and telling them no all the time when they're beginning to discover things. The world at that point in their time, in their toddler years, should be this, like, I'm saying this for the benefit of those that are raising toddlers, and, but, but, but for all of us who are around kids, man, the world should be a beautiful, wonderful place that you as parents and we as the people of God put structure around. That's why you childproof your house, right? It's not to keep your stuff good, but, but you childproof your house so that, so that you, you can direct them into discovering wonderful things so that you don't have to say no all the time. You could say yes all the time. When they, I remember my kids, we had this, uh, we have this island thing in our house and under it there's like paper plates and, and plastic silverware because we got no class. We eat paper plate and plastic all the time. But, um, but no, uh, but there's a thing under there. And I remember so many times um, seeing either Kate or Daniel like in a diaper, sitting, sitting there on the ground, and all that stuff was everywhere. Plates everywhere, and, and forks everywhere, and, and you know, and, and they're just like, whatever snack they were eating was all over their face, and it was just like, everything was good in the world. And what was so important about that moment was that this, in this home, that's okay to do, because those forks are amazing. That plate is perfectly round. Wow! And that goes on into all, and, and you begin to see their creativity develop as they look at things, and then they get language, and they talk about things. It's beautiful. And the reason I'm sharing this with you is because the kingdom is supposed to be like that, that, that that's how we are supposed to approach things. Matthew 18 teaches us that, that we're to look at these things, that we're to, to see and to have faith like one of these little ones. And that requires a, an element of awe, of curiosity, of creativity. And so I think that whether we're raising kids or that we're discipling adults, that we got to work on the hand slapping, no, don't ask questions. And we got to go, what's on your mind? We got to begin to, to help see parameters and structure. That's what the word of God is. It's, it child proofs us in this world. That's how we've got to begin to see the structures that God's created. Not like some oppressive structure of you can't do this, you can't do that, but it's what keeps you safe that, so that you can enjoy and see the awe and the beauty and the character and the nature of God. And guess what, guys? We get the privilege of opening up that to, to a world that has not seen that. And we get the privilege of, of answering questions. We get the privilege of, of not only answering questions, but asking questions as Jesus did that would excite curiosity in others. Hey, who do they say I am? Jesus would say to his disciples. And give the guys the opportunity to, to reply and to respond. And so whether it's raising kids, like I said, or, or working in Sunday school or, or working with adults, reject adultification. I just made that word up. Don't adultify. Reject that. But rediscover curiosity. Take it from Einstein, right? If you don't take it from me, rediscover a holy curiosity. Rediscover the awe and the wonder. Um, a few weeks ago, I was riding down the street and I was heading towards the mountains. It was after the first rain and it was early in the morning and I was just, it was kind of quiet. There weren't a lot of people on the street and I looked up and I saw the snow-covered mountain and it literally took my breath away. It was like, like wow, how beautiful. And I want to capture those kind of moments and go, what kind of God creates mountains that are all bumpy with white stuff and, 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 and contrasting on green stuff and all these other things around? I want that in my life and I think that you do too. And so before we go um, into Jesus' response, I just felt it was important to call us back to a holy curiosity. So now Jesus, um, <laughs> interestingly, does a Jesus. <laughs> they want a meeting with Jesus. They want to have a, a, a sit down with him. They want to see him in action. And this is what the scripture says. Um, it says that Philip gets with Andrew and the two guys talk about it and then they say, hey, the Greeks want to see Jesus and so let's go talk to him about it. And when they go to talk to Jesus about what the Greeks wanted, Jesus has a reply. And, and how many of you know that when Jesus is asked a question sometimes, the reply doesn't seem to fit the question. It's like some whole other thing. Well, it is if you read the Bible. So if you're, this is what happened. It says Jesus replied, okay, remember Greeks, I want to see Jesus. Andrew, Philip, hey, Jesus, the Greeks want to see you. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Okay? 
And then it goes on, I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. I'm thinking Andrew and Philip are just like, yeah, but they just wanted to see you, you know? <laughs> right? It's good. It's good that we're getting all deep here, Jesus, but I just want to see you. And then he goes on and he says, and the man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. And then he goes on to say, whoever serves me must follow me. Where I am, my servant will be also. My father will honor the one who serves me. And then he goes on to say, now my heart is troubled. What then shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. And with the time I have remaining, I just want to turn your attention as you're marching towards Easter to listen to his reply. That maybe your heart's cry is like mine. I want to see Jesus. I want to see him. I want to see where Jesus is at work. I want to please him. I want to follow him. I, I, I want to be true to my, my claim that I am a Christ follower. And I think that you do too. I believe that you do too by the way that you live your life. And so as I want to see Jesus, this is what he is, is calling us to. And I've and, I, and I, I feel like Jesus was saying this. You want to see me? See this. Okay, first thing he says. Now see this. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. You want to see me? See this. This is my time. You're, he took a, a, a holy curiosity. Jesus takes a holy curiosity and he elevates it to some opportunities for some transformational decisions, okay? So you might have a holy curiosity, and as you get curious, and as you poke into God, as you probe into God, you're going to see decisions and opportunity to, to do things that will transform your life. And the Greeks were having this very opportunity. The first thing that I see that Jesus says was, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Of course, he was talking about his soon death on the cross, but it was interesting to me that the words Jesus used were not, the hour has come for me to be crucified on the cross. It's not what he said. He said, the hour has come for me to be glorified. I think what Jesus might have for us, and I think what he might have been saying to them, was that if we're going to see him, let's see this. Let's see a godly perspective. Let's see a God-like perspective. Jesus wasn't focusing on the suffering. He was focusing on the glorification at the end. And how many times in our lives when we're looking to see Jesus and see things that all we can see is the suffering and the suffering is real. The suffering is real. This is not that talk of saying, oh, come on, man, pick yourself up and dust yourself off. That's, this is not that. The suffering is real. But what Jesus enables us to see is it's leading to something far greater. And for him, he knew that moment was glorification. The second thing that, that Jesus says is, um, I tell you the truth right? And this is, whenever you see in scripture, I tell you the truth. It's not like he was lying before. It's, this is about to be an important announcement. Like, like get, get your attention here. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Jesus was speaking of his own death, that his own death was going to be multiplied to bless countless millions. Like, God so loved the world, and where I, where I stop with something like this is when I want to see Jesus, sometimes all I can see is me. All I can see is the things that I want to hold on to. And, and maybe you're not like me, but maybe you are. I'm pretty much guessing that you are because you're part of this human race. But, but, but what we do oftentimes is we hold on really tightly to the things that are good. And in doing so, we don't let good things die in order to embrace what's best. And the principle that he shows us in creation is that even a seed, that seed falls to the ground and it dies and it's multiplied and it becomes a blessing to many. And maybe the word of the Lord for some in seeing that is seeing um, the need to um, get to this next point of, I'm going to say it, dying to selfish living. Dying to selfish living. I don't think that we set out every morning to wake up and, and go, I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to listen to some good Christian music on the way to work and doggone it, I'm going to live selfish. <laughs> I don't think anyone sets out to do that. I think that there may be some of us that we look back in our, in our past and, and, and we wanted to get ahead and maybe we weren't following Jesus and, and we want to push someone down to get ahead. Maybe there's some of that. But, but I think that there's this understanding that when we hold on too tightly, and when we, um, when we miss certain opportunities to 
um, to do exactly what scripture says, to, to die to ourself so that we might be alive in Christ, the result is that we make decisions that are selfish. And let me unpack it a little bit. You're familiar with this if you want to turn with me to Galatians 5 and 16. It says, So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. The sinful nature desires what's contrary to the Spirit, the Spirit what's contrary to the sinful nature. They're in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Jesus says to them, okay, I want to see you. Colonel Louis dies to the ground, falls. He says when you let something go, when you let something die, it can be resurrected again and to bless many as it's going to be with me. Then he says this next statement. The man or woman who loves their life will lose it, while the one who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. It's another one of those Jesus riddles. And right now you might be going, okay, I'm so tired and hungry right now. This is the time to really hang on. Don't think about lunch right now. Just, this is a takeaway for you. It's not a Jesus riddle. It's a, it's a literary contrast, right? Jesus is saying, the, the man who loves his life in this world will lose it. The man who hates his life in this world will gain it for eternal life. These are two ends of the spectrum, love and hate. And the thing that we focus on in there is, is as we look at it, you look at the pronoun, the one who loves his life or her life. We live in a culture where it's me, my right? I love it my way. And what Jesus is saying is if you're willing to die to that, if you're willing to die to those selfish wants and needs, you're going to really come alive. If you, all that you can focus on are those things, you're going to lose it all. And I think that we all can agree with that at an intellectual level. We can understand that. But um, how many things in, in, in our life are ours, right? My time, my stuff, there are certain things that I'm like, really, yeah, take it. It's yours. But then there's other stuff that's like my stuff. You know, I remember when I was um, traveling with Youth with a Mission, you only own a little few things, you know? And so it's like your backpack. Like, just don't touch my backpack. That's my stuff, right? Um, um, some of us were just very protective of my time, right? Of my talents, of my abilities, right? Of the me aspect of that. That, that yes, there is something that God has given you, and we say that, and that he has a plan and a purpose to use through you. But if you're not careful— that me and that my life can become something that will keep you from seeing Jesus, even in your pursuit of wanting to serve Jesus. Am I making any sense? And so, so what he's calling us to is this life by the Spirit. And this life by the Spirit has something in it called self-control, which is different than selfishness, right? This life in the Spirit helps us to know who we are, what we're gifted, what we're good at, what we like, what we don't like, but to how to control that in an appropriate way so that we don't lose our life, so that we gain it, so that we learn to be generous like we saw in Mary and like we saw in Martha and like we see in Jesus. Um, my life is not my own. I wrote this down. My life is not my own. I made a willful decision. My life is not my own for two reasons. I'm speaking as a, as, a, as a Christian man. My life is not my own, number one, because I was bought with a price, according to what Scripture says. And this is what we celebrate in Easter. My life is not my own, number two, because I willfully surrendered my life to him. These are fundamentals of our faith that, that we said, okay, I am going to obey Scripture that says my life is now a living sacrifice to you. This is my reasonable act of worship. And so, so Greek guys, you want to see Jesus? Maybe you want to see a miracle. You want to hang out with them. You want to give them a high five. He's saying, look at this. You want to see me? See this. You want to see me? See this. And I think that that same message is for us today. I, I alluded to the verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and 20, and it, the context there is about sexual immorality. And I think that it fits, you know, when he says, Wait, what are you guys doing, Corinthian church? You're crazy. You're believing in this cultic practice of temple prostitution, and you can only imagine what, um, what a, a perverted culture that would think that their worship looked like visitation of a prostitute, like they had done a good thing when they went to the temple to visit her. And then they come into their Christian faith, and he's saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. You, can't, you guys can't be doing this stuff because your body is not your own. It was 
bought with a price. Don't you know that this is the temple of the Holy Spirit? And so maybe what we ought to see, we ought to see the fact that, that he's in us, right? And then it goes on, and just prior to that, in 1 Corinthians 6, 12, it says this um, famous passage, all things are permissible, but not all things are beneficial. How many of you could raise your hand high in the sky and say, I know I can do whatever I want, but it ain't always going to be the good thing for me. Hey, you have the right to do whatever. You have the right over your body. You have the right over your decisions. You have the right over your choices. All things are lawful or permissible, but not all things are beneficial. And it falls into the same thing. And then the call is, therefore, therefore, and whenever you see a therefore, what do you do, good Bible students? You figure out what it's there for, right? Therefore, honor God with your body. And so I think there was something to see there um, of, of our choices. The final C, and this is what I'll close with, um, is what he says. That, um, actually, there's two more. I pretty much lied. Whoever serves me must follow me. Where I am, my servant will, must also be. My father will honor the one who serves me. You want to see something? See this. This is verse 26. Serve me and stay close to me. Um, I love this verse in Galatians also. In Galatians 5.25, it says, Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let's not become conceding or conceited or provoking or envying each other. So it's that idea that you got to want to see something? See this. See your closeness with me. See you um, serving me. See you following me. See you staying in step with me that I belong to you and you belong to me and that's the way that it's intended. The final, this it really is the final. And, and I, I, I sat on this one for a little bit and, it, and, and I think that, um, well, I'm just gonna say what I think. Verse 27, it says, Now my heart is troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Maybe something else that we're supposed to see is the humanity of Jesus, that, that all of what he was um, facing in that moment as he was preparing for um, Good Friday, where he hung on the cross, knowing full well what would happen on the third day on Easter Sunday. As he was preparing for that, it wasn't some easy thing. It wasn't some just like, you know, okay, business as usual. He wrestled. There was agony. There was difficulty. And I think that what we're supposed to see is that it is okay to suffer with the magnitude of, or excuse me, it's okay to wrestle with the magnitude of what we're called to. It is not easy to live unselfish. It is not easy to follow him. It's not easy to stay in step with the spirit. It's not easy to say no to the stuff that we know is not beneficial, but we really want it. Not easy. And so it's okay that we wrestle with the fact that it's not easy. But Jesus asks a rhetorical question. He says, well, what should I do then? Shall I say this? Um, Father, save me from this hour? Shall I say to God, I'm wrestling. God, just lift it off of my shoulders. And I love how Jesus responds. He says, no, this was the very reason I came was for this hour. And I feel like um, for, for us today in that, it's, it's I don't want to sound harsh when I say it, but I'm, it might, that, that there are some things that we're called to do that are difficult. There are some trials that we're going through that are very difficult. There are some suffering that we're encountering that is real difficult, and, and it is not something to be slighted. And so please hear my heart when we say that, when I say that. But what, what I read, what Jesus is saying, if you want to see something, see this. It, those aren't the times for us to, to make excuses. Those, those aren't the times for us to go, oh yeah, I'm going to do this because this is really hard in my life. Those are the times for us to press into God and go, no, even though it's very hard, no, I'm not giving up. This is the very reason that I'm here. This is my hour. Does that make sense to you? And so I want to encourage you in what you're going through, encourage myself in it, that, that the very moments in our tests and our trials and our difficulty where we're ready to wave the white flag, where we have every good reason to say, nope, I'm done. I'm out. I'm moving on. Those are, your breakthrough is right around the corner. I have seen it over and over again in my own life. And so don't give up and don't quit. And so, um, as I wrap this thing up, I'll just recap it for us in a way of, of application. It's this thing. As you go towards Easter, as you begin to now march towards uh, Good Friday and Easter Sunday, my prayer for you is this, that, that as you see Jesus and as you seek to see him, 
um, God, that your prayer would be this. Help me to see from an eternal perspective, seeing the opportunity to bring God glory more than the sacrifice. As you see Jesus, your prayer might be, Lord, help me deal with my selfishness. Um, as it is written literary and poetically, hating my version of my life so as to gain your version for my life. Does that make sense? The, uh, I don't want to do what I want in my selfish flesh living. I want to do what you want in the redemptive um, call that you have for me. The third thing is, as I see you, God, help me to stay close to your plan to serve you with my life. My life literally belongs to you on your terms for your purposes. We might not be able to say that um, with such confidence this morning, but as we close, I'd like to pray it over you that, um, that God would touch you in such a way that would, would give you an encouragement that this week um, you can, as you're facing selfish moments, as you're facing difficulties, as you're facing your trials, that you can say, God, my life literally belongs to you because one, you bought it with a price, but two, I willfully gave it to you. And, um, and so the ones that wanted to see Jesus, this is what he wanted them to see. So why don't you stand with me this morning? God, as I, I read your word, I felt convicted on, on many levels. I felt encouraged on other levels, and I pray that the result of whatever your Holy Spirit wants to do this morning, that you who began this good work, you would faithfully complete it this morning. God, as our heart's desire is to know you, is to see you, is to be drawn into your presence. God, I pray that for us that are seeking to follow you, that you would help us in these areas, help us to have that eternal perspective, to not see the struggle as much as we see the God of the struggle, the God who's with us in it. Lord, that, that we would not miss um, the opportunity to be unselfish by the help of your Holy Spirit. God, that we would truly be able to give our lives to you fresh and anew daily and walk with you. And Lord, I, I thank you that you're gracious, that you're compassionate. I thank you that you're good. And I pray, Lord, that um, for those that are here today that are, that are even thinking about the possibility of following Jesus, as you're hearing these words, my prayer is that you would take comfort in your curiosity, that you can, you can look and that you can ask questions. And my, heart, my prayer is that your heart would be open to the answers that he gives. And so God, I pray that you would speak deeply to our hearts. I pray that you would bless your people today. And I ask it in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Amen. God bless you. If you need prayer, we would love to pray with you today. Have a great day. Chosen me